This is Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Today's Bible study, April 18th, 2020. World's going crazy over this corona thing. But uh, this Bible study is going to be on falling away. Our opening scriptures will be in the book of Thessalonians, 2nd Thessalonians, matter of fact, chapter 2, and we're going to start at verse 1. Now, Thessalonica was a city in Greece. And Paul wrote to the church in Thessalonica. They were called Thessalonians. So, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. So here it is. It's talking about the second coming and us being gathered together. Okay, verse 2. That ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day, what day? The second coming. For that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. Hmm. For that day, the second coming, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. So, who's the man of sin? Hmm. Well, in the book of Revelation, he's known as the beast. And in, I think it's 1 John, they call him the Antichrist. Just different names for the same entity. So, Christ, so we're warned not to be deceived and that the second coming wouldn't happen until there was a falling away first, and the man of sin, the son of perdition, has to be revealed. Verse 4. Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. God. Now, a little note here. Uh, there's a group of people called call themselves preterists, and they say that all Bible prophecy has occurred and is in the past. Everything. Well, there's different flavors of them, you know, sort of like Baskin Robbins, you know, what is it, 32 flavors? But um, they want you to think that in, uh, in 70 A.D., the Roman army destroyed Jerusalem because the Antichrist, who rejected Jesus, um, they rebelled against Rome. Now, Rome was sent against them as punishment. For their wickedness just like this uh, coming one world government we're getting european union and the ussa we're we're all being punished for our wickedness that's why this one world government's coming upon us and it's going to be the one world government of the devil not of christ now back to 70 a.d 
the um, you know who's well it rhymes with uh, news and uh, the word starts with a J you know like a newspaper well the thing is in 70 AD this group rebelled and the Roman army went in and destroyed Jerusalem read Matthew 24 where Jesus said that not one stone would be a, upon another on the temple well that happened Wailing Wall is not the temple I'm sorry if you want to believe the Wailing Wall was part of the temple, then Jesus is a liar. But the thing is, in 70 AD, the Roman army went in, destroyed Jerusalem, and ripped apart the temple. Why? Well, there was a lot of gold in the temple. And the temple caught fire. And from what I understand, the gold melted and it went in between the cracks of the stones used to build it. So they ripped apart the temple and scraped all the gold from off the rocks. And then when they were done scraping all the gold off one stone, they'd cast it aside and then go to the next one. There was a lot of gold in the temple, people. So the prophecy that Jesus did, said in tw uh, Matthew 24 and Mark 13 came to pass not one stone was left upon another but the the point is though preterists will want you to believe that general titus was this man of sin that sat in the temple of god showing himself that he is god now let's read verse four again second thessalonians chapter two verse four uh well verse three for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now, if General Titus in 70 AD did this, went and sat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself that he is God, a general... Do you think the emperor of Rome would have mind a general telling the emperor of Rome that he's God and that he has to worship him? Uh, so either this happened or it didn't. And I say it didn't happen. I don't think General Titus told the Roman emperor that he was God and that the Roman emperor was going to have to worship him. Besides all that, guess what? General Titus was the son of the Roman emperor. <laughs> Can you imagine a son telling his father that he's God and he's got to worship him? I don't think so. All right, so. So if the temple was destroyed in 70 AD and this didn't happen, then guess what? My bet, and I'm not really a better, but my bet, my guess, is that there will be another temple. Now, I've heard rumors, um, some from Jewish sources, if you can call them that, that uh, they've got a temple going underground. I don't know if it's true. I haven't been to Jerusalem. I wasn't invited. So, all right, so he is, so that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And there's people who will tell you this is the Holy Spirit. That the... Um, until the Holy Spirit is taken out of the way that the mystery of iniquity or gross evil sin uh, will not be revealed. Well, the problem is if the Holy Spirit is taken out of the earth, out of the way, how are people going to be saved? They can't be. Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, 
he cannot see the kingdom of God. Well, so I'm of the opinion that um, maybe it's Michael the Archangel or Gabriel. I don't know. That's going to be, you know, step aside. I don't know. All right. It's only, uh, so only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed. Hmm. Whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. People, this ties in with the book of Revelation where it talks about the false prophet having lying wonders, miracles, false miracles. Remember when um, Aaron's staff when him and Moses were standing before Pharaoh during the before the first Passover, Aaron threw his staff down, it became a serpent. And the magicians of Egypt did the same thing. Their staffs became serpents. Except for Aaron's staff ate their serpents. Ah, yes. And another thing, too, when you read the first chapter of Job, um, God let Satan um, perform miracles that killed uh, Job's sons. And he, Satan had the power to strike Job with boils. Job chapter 1, read it. I mean, we'll get to it, but I'm, I'm just pointing all this now. So, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. When you get people like John Hagee that says, well, you know, the Jews have got another covenant. They got a back door. Yeah, they're going to go out the back door, all right. They're not going to go in from the back door. They're going to go out the back door. That they, well, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause, God, not Satan, God, shall send them strong delusion. What's a delusion? You believe something that's false, but yet you believe it's true. It's a lie. And that's what the Bible says. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation. Huh. God chose us from the beginning for salvation? Boy, that uh, somebody tell that to the Free Will Baptist Church. But if you believe that, they'll call you a Calvinist. But, you know, I'm not a Calvinist. I do believe in election, but I'm not a Calvinist because John Calvin did not die for me. 
Because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. All right, so what is the great falling away? Well, let's go take a look back at the beginning where let's take a look at Satan's plans from the beginning. Genesis chapter 3. I know in other studies I've beat this to death, but, you know, I have to realize that sometimes I've got new listeners, so. All right, so let's take a look at Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God hath had made. And he said unto the woman, so here it is, the serpent's talking to the woman. And uh, if you don't know what the serpent is, well, let's take a look. Uh, let's see, what is the serpent? Well, let's go to Revelation chapter 12 and verse 9. Uh, talking about cast out of heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent. Why old serpent? Because that serpent been around for thousands of years. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan. I've had people tell me that the devil and Satan are not the same being. Hmm. Where do they get their information from? Oh, that's right, Satan. The devil. Yeah. They don't get their stuff from the Bible, that's for, that's for sure. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. And that's you and that's me. He won't, won't, he's got us deceived on something. Maybe not everything, but, you know. Which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels, ooh, Satan's got angels. Wow. And his angels were cast out with him. Okay. So, that old serpent, back to Genesis 6. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Question mark. What was Satan's first thing to do? Question God's words and his commands. First thing out of his mouth. And it worked from the beginning, and it works today, and it's been working for 6,000 years approximately. Why, why change the game plan when it works? Hey, you know, you don't, you know, when you're playing a, a ball game, um, if you got a game plan that works, you don't change it until it quits working, right? Verse 2, And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which, it, which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, God's a liar. Well, that's the Bob translation. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. Oh, man. You know, God's holding you back. That's what he's doing. He's trying to keep you down. He's the man, and he's trying to keep you down. 
Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Oh yeah, you're going to know evil. So, are we starting to get the idea here? Oh yeah. All right, let's go to the second chapter of the book of Judges. Now, people, I tell you what, you could read the book of Judges, and it reads like today's newspapers. It really does. My opinion, anyways. All right, Judges chapter 2, verse 1. And an angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochum and said, I made you to go, uh, to go up out of Egypt and have brought you unto the land which I swear unto your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. Huh. Now, uh, there's a very interesting study. Uh, it's called the Angel of the Lord in the Old Testament. The angel of the Lord speaks in the first person, speaking for God. And some really good Bible scholars think that this angel of the Lord is pre-incarnate Christ. And uh, there's some, yeah, I believe it's true. And uh, I think this is possibly another manifestation Because look at this. An angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochum and said, I made you to go up out of Egypt and have brought you unto the land which I swear, I swear unto your fathers. Now who swore? God. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. So he's speaking in the first person. Verse 2, and ye shall make no league, in other words, don't make any agreement, and ye shall make no league with the inhabitants of this land. Why? Because they were the Canaanites. Who are the Canaanites? They were the satanic hybrids of fallen angels and humans of Genesis 6, the giants, the Canaanites. Well, not all the Canaanites were giants, but some of them were. Think David and Goliath. You know, that's why God destroyed the earth in the flood. But there were these hideous monsters after the flood. And that's why King David, future King David, faced Goliath, the giant. You know, some uh, even the small giants were probably 12 foot. Yeah, that was, a, you know, one of the small ones. They've found skeletons like this all over the world. And then they, people buy them up and then they hide this, the, the bones because they don't want us to know. But, uh, you know, it's part of the great deception, the falling away. So verse 2, And ye shall make no league with the inhabitants of this land. Ye shall throw down their altars. Why? Their altars were to Satan. You know, they were worshiping these devils. Ye shall throw down their altars, but ye have not obeyed my voice. Why have ye done this? Wherefore, I also said, I will not drive them out from before you, but they shall be as thorns in your sides and their gods these fallen angels and their gods shall be a snare unto you what's a snare a trap we're not talking about drums people we're you know a snare is a trap verse 4 and it came to pass when the angel of the lord spake these words unto all the children of israel that the people lifted up their voice and wept. 
And they called the name of that place Bochum, and they sacrificed there unto the Lord. All right. They did for a while. And then what happens? Well, Joshua dies. And then we read in verse 10. Skip down to verse 10. And also all that generation were gathered unto their fathers, and there arose another generation after them, which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. And the children of Israel did evil, did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam. Now, Baal is just a generic word that means Lord. And Balaam became tied in with Satanism. All right, and they served Balaam. Verse 12. And they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt and followed other gods, the devil's people, and followed other gods, and of the gods of the people that were round about them, and bowed themselves unto them, and provoked the Lord to anger. And they forsook the Lord and served Baal and Ashtaroth. Ashtaroth, if memory serves me correctly, she was she was the queen of heaven. Her name is also Ishtar. Her name is also Easter the goddess of spring fertility. Yes, people, that Easter. You know, bunny rabbits and eggs. Yeah. What do eggs and bunny rabbits have to do with Christ? Um, I can't find it in the Bible. If anybody can show me in the Bible where Jesus said to color, color Easter eggs and Adopt bunny rabbits. Let me know because I'm kind of ignorant on this thing. And they forsook the Lord and served Baal and Ashtaroth. Verse 14. Here's the punchline. And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. And he delivered them into the hands of spoilers that spoiled them. We're not talking about giving your kids thousands of dollars of presents at Christmas time. Not that kind of spoiled. We're talking about like when you leave a steak out in the hot sun in the summer all day and the meat rots. It's spoiled. It's no good. And he, God, delivered them into the hands of spoilers that spoiled them, and he sold them into the hands of their enemies round about so that they could not any longer stand before their enemies. Whithersoever they went out, the hand of the Lord was against them for evil, as the Lord had said, and the Lord had sworn unto them, and they were greatly distressed. Nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges, which delivered them out of the hand of those that spoiled them. And yet they would not hearken unto their judges. But they went a-whoring after other gods. Doesn't this sound like America? But they went a-whoring after other gods, and bowed themselves unto them, they turned quickly out of the way which their fathers walked in, obeying the commandments of the Lord, but they did not so. Oh boy. And when the Lord raised them up judges, then the Lord was with the judge and delivered them out of the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. For it repented the Lord because of their groanings by reason of them that oppressed them and vexed them. You know who the name of some of these judges were? 
Well, if you remember the story of Deborah, she was one of them. Remember the story of Samson? He was one of their judges. Oh, yeah. Samson uh, had a problem with women. I know that story quite well. All right. Um, verse 19. And it came to pass when the judge was dead that they returned and corrupted themselves more than their fathers in following other gods to serve them and to bow down unto them. They ceased not from their own doings nor from their stubborn way. And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. And he said, Because that this people hath transgressed my covenant, which I commanded their fathers, and have not hearkened unto my voice. See, didn't we read in verse 1, The Lord kept his the covenant. The Lord kept his bargain. The Lord made a covenant with them, which is like a contract. He kept, he kept his part of the deal, but Israel didn't keep their part of the deal our ancestors. Nope. They didn't do it. Verse 21. I also will not henceforth drive out any from before them of the nations which Joshua left when he died, that through them I may prove Israel whether they will keep the way of the Lord to walk therein as their fathers did keep it or not. Therefore the Lord left those nations without driving them out hastily, neither delivered he them into the hand of Joshua. What nations? The Canaanites, people. All right, let's read uh, Judges chapter 3. Now, these are the nations which the Lord left to prove Israel by them, even as many of Israel as had not known all the wars of Canaan. Only that the generations of the children of Israel might know to teach them war, at the least such as before knew nothing thereof, namely the five lords of the Philistines. Um, Sam, Sam uh, I'm sorry, King David fought Goliath, who was a Philistine. He was, they were the giants. Namely, five lords of the Philistines and all the Canaanites and the Sidonians and the Hivites that dwell in Mount Lebanon from Mount Baal Hermon unto the entering in of Hamath. Now, Baal Hermon, Mount Baal Hermon. Baal means Lord. So it's Mount Lord Hermon or Hermon. You know, it's interesting that um, this is part of the area of the Canaanites. Now, I'm not a big proponent of the Book of Enoch, the one by Charles, the translation by Charles. There's more than one Book of Enoch. Uh, one is on, I think, magic or something, and I, I I've never even read that. I know better. But according to the Book of Enoch, the one by Charles, uh, Mount Hermon is where the fallen angels made their pact um, about how they were going to interbreed with the human women. I don't know if it's true. Um, you know, parts of Enoch look like it could be true, and then other parts um, are like way out there. I don't know. I don't know if, how much I trust the uh, Book of Enoch, but uh, I just find it interesting that uh, Mount Hermon is where supposedly the fallen angels did their... Uh, made their promise to each other to do the dirty deed of Genesis 6, which probably 95% of all the churches out there will deny what even happened in Genesis 6. And uh, if you're not sure what happened, send me an email or look at my playlist and look up the angels that sinned. Um, 
Clifton Fowler did a book called The Angels That Sinned in the 1920s, I think it was, or 1930s. He founded the um, Colorado Christian University or whatever. It's like Denver Bible College now or something. It's funny. I used to pass it all the time when I lived in Colorado. I never went there, but uh, he wrote a wonderful book. It's a booklet. You know, it's probably... 30, 40 pages long. It's not huge. And uh, I took some information from it and added some of my own and did a commentary on it. Probably about 10 or 12 hours of study. Um, by the time you're through, you know what happened in Genesis 6. And I'm sorry, it wasn't good men marrying bad women. And then they had giants for kids. Uh, you know, when believers marry unbelievers, they don't have... 12-foot Goliath monstrosities for children. It just, it doesn't happen. It doesn't make any sense. But this is the nonsense, the falling away that the churches teach nowadays. I mean, it's disgusting. It makes me sick of my stomach. And then I get called a heretic. Whatever. Uh, all right, so... Verse 4, and they were to prove Israel by them. In other words, they were going to be a test. These Canaanites were going to be a test. And they were to prove Israel by them to know whether they would hearken unto the commandments of the Lord, which he commanded their fathers by the hands of Moses. So God's going to use these satanic hybrids to test Israel. You're going to follow Satan in his... Uh, Satan and his angels' children, or are you going to listen to the Lord? Hmm. Verse 5. And the children of Israel dwelt among the Canaanites, Hittites, and Amorites, and Perizzites, and Hivites, and Jebusites. And they took their daughters to be their wives. Ah, there's the punchline. I bet you these were gorgeous creatures. And the men just looked at them and lusted after them. Because, let's face it, ladies, we like the, you know, the looks of a package. And I learned a long time ago the contents of the package is a lot more important than the looks of the package. But, uh, you know, I was guilty of this as anybody. Unfortunately, uh, you know, I've said it many times. When a man marries a woman for her looks and a woman marries a man for his money, uh, not exactly a match made in heaven. So... Israel, and they took their daughters to be their wives and gave their daughters to their sons. They gave their daughters to the sons of the Canaanites and served their gods, which is the fallen angels, the devils, Satan's little helpers. So, you wonder why there's so much evil in the world? This is it, people. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and forgot the Lord their God and served Balaam and the groves. Why the groves? Because they would hide in the forest to do their little deeds like child sacrifice. When you read about the groves in the Bible, that's what they're talking about. Witches. Um, they consider oaks sacred. They would do their little sacrifices, human sacrifices, in the groves of trees. Verse 8. Therefore the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he sold them into the hand of, oh boy, Cushan Rishapham, king of Mesopotamia, now, Mesopotamia is in the area where Babylon is. And the children of Israel served uh, 
Kush Han Rish Ha Fam, eight years. I probably slaughtered that name, but you get the idea. And when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, why were they crying? Because they're being oppressed. And you know what, people? Back in when I was a young, young baby in Christ in the early 90s, I used to fear, really fear, the persecution that I knew was going to come. But you know what? I really don't fear it anymore. I'm concerned for family. But you know what? Persecution is going to be good. When, when people have to make a choice of dying for their faith in Christ or denying him, and Christ warned people that you had to endure unto the end. But he that shall endureth unto the end shall be saved. I'm not sure if I'm paraphrasing that or not, but uh, they were told you had to be endured to the end. Christ said that if you denied him before men, that he would deny you before the Father and his angels. And yes, I know Peter denied Christ three times, but he repented and he died for his faith. So, he endured unto the end. And uh, I look forward to meeting Peter one day. Probably, hopefully get some fishing tips from him. What do you think? Um, but persecution is going to bring revival to the remnant. When people start getting their heads cut off for Christ, now that's an interesting thing. Uh, I'm not sure if I'll mention it, but the Bible says that um, when you're brought up before the councils and they're getting ready to kill you, not to think about what you're going to say because the Holy Ghost will speak through you. And that will be your proof that you're on your way to the kingdom. I mean, that's a that that's that's your that's your ticket, people. You're going to have your ticket punched. I mean, that's that's a guaranteed. That's what Christ said, Matthew 24. Um. So, but there's going to be people denying the faith. They're going to want to serve their flesh, live in. Didn't we read that in Second Thessalonians? That uh, people would rather live pleasure rather than the truth? Oh, yeah. So, Judges 3 and verse 9. And when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer to the children of Israel, who delivered them, even Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. And he judged Israel and went out to war, and the Lord delivered uh, Cush, whatever his name is, King of Mesopotamia, into his hand, and his hand prevailed against Cush, whatever his name is. And the land had rest forty years. And Othniel, the son of Kenaz, died. And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel, because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. People, you wonder why we've got so much oppression that's just now starting to come to the surface. Because our people have done so much evil in the sight of the Lord. The Lord is going to give them into the hands of these wicked men. It's coming, people. It's coming. I, I don't claim to be a prophet. I'm just, I'm just a student and a teacher of the Bible. That's all I am. And if the past is any indication of the future, well, this is it. I mean, come on, people. All these people that think they're going to fly away any second? No. We read that at the beginning in 2 Thessalonians. They can't fly out of here in the rapture until this man of sin's revealed. That's not going to happen. 
they're going to be sorely disappointed, to say the least. And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel, because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. And he gathered unto him the children of Ammon and Amalek. You know what Amalek is? He was a grandson of Esau, Edom. God said that he would have war with Amalek from generation to generation, people. All right, let's take a look at uh, Exodus 17 and verse 16. For he said, because the Lord hath sworn, sworn, that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Now, why is that? Well, Esau married a Hittite woman, actually two of them, and had children by them. And they were these fallen angel hybrids that 95% of the churches will tell you that they can now be saved. So instead of us having enemies of the Lord, we've got oh, what they'll tell you is potentially uh, potential people that can be saved. I don't think so. That the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Does that sound like he's going to change his mind? No. How about Deuteronomy 25, 19? Therefore it shall be when the Lord thy God hath given thee rest from all thine enemies round about it. Oh, wait a minute. Enemies? But, but, but the Lord loves everybody and wants to save everybody, right? That's what almost all the churches will teach you today. The great falling away, right? Therefore it shall be when the Lord thy God hath given thee rest from all thine enemies round about in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance to possess it, that thou shalt blot out, that thou shalt blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. Thou shalt not forget it. Blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven? What? But the Lord loves everybody. Oh, yeah. Well, that's what they want you to think. All right, let's go back to Judges chapter 3. Verse 13. And he gathered unto him the children of Ammon and Amalek, and went and smote Israel, and possessed the city of palm trees. So the children of Israel served Eglon, the king of Moab, eighteen years. And when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised them up a deliverer, Ehud, the son of Gera, a Benjamite, a man left-handed, and by him the children of Israel sent a present unto Eglon, the king of Moab. And he who had made him a dagger, which had two edges, of a cubit length. Boy, people, let me tell you something. That's a long dagger. A cubit is about 18 inches. About half a meter for you European people. <laughs> That's one heck of a dagger. A double-edged double dagger. Half a meter or 18 inches long. Whew. Foot and a half long. That's a big one. And he did gird it under his raiment upon his right thigh. And he brought the present unto Eglon, king of Moab. And Eglon was a very fat man. And when he had made an end to offer the present, he sent away the people that bear the present. But he himself turned again from the quarries that were by Gilgal and said, I have a secret errand unto thee, O king, who said, Keep silence. In other words, keep quiet. And all that stood by him went out from him. So here it is. He says, I got a secret message from the, uh, you know, from, from the Lord. Uh, well, maybe not the Lord, but I have, a, I have a secret message for you, king. So the king says, well, be quiet. And he sends all his servants out. So he wants to be alone with this person. 
So, verse 20. And Ehud came unto him, and he was sitting in a summer parlor, for which he had for himself alone. And Ehud said, I have a message from God unto thee. Ah, okay. And he arose out of his seat. And Ehud put forth his left hand and took the dagger from his right thigh and thrust it into his belly. And the haft also went in after the blade. So I guess that's the um, handle. And the fat closed upon the blade so that he could not draw the dagger out of his belly and the dirt came out. I'm... I don't know why. It says dirt, but... Then Ehud went forth through the porch and shut the doors of the parlor upon him and locked them. When he was gone out, his servants came, and when they saw that, behold, the doors of the parlor were locked, they said, Surely he covereth his feet in his summer chamber. And they tarried till they were ashamed, and behold, he opened not the doors of the parlor before they took a key and opened them, and behold, their Lord was fallen down dead on the earth. And he who had escaped while they tarried and passed beyond the quarries and escaped unto Sirath. So, and it came to pass when he was come that he blew a trumpet in the mountain of Ephraim and the children of Israel went down with him from the mount and he before them. And he said unto them, Follow after me, for the Lord hath delivered your enemies, the Moabites, into your hand. And they went down after him and took the fords of Jordan toward Moab and suffered not a man to pass over. And they slew of Moab at that time about 10,000 men, all lusty and all men of valor, and there escaped not a man. So Moab was subdued that day under the hand of Israel, and the land had rest fourscore years. That's about 80 years. That's about two generations. Um, and after him was Shamgar, the son of Anath, which slew of the Philistines 600 men with an ox goad, and he also delivered Israel. Now, four scores of, yeah, 80 years. And um, 10,000 men, that is about... Um, Three or four divisions, army divisions. That's a, that's a lot of people to kill. You know, Israel was called an army. And the Canaanites were called their enemies. I mean, come on, people. You know, uh, really, most of the churches are... The great falling away, right? All right, let's read uh, the book of Judges chapter 4. I've been wanting to do uh, the book of Judges, so I'll make it part of this study, I guess. Verse 1, Judges chapter 4, verse 1. And the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord when Ehud was dead. Are you starting to get the picture? And the Lord sold him into the hands of Jabin, king of Canaan, that reigned in Hazor, the captain of whose host was Sisera, which dwelt in Harosheth of the Gentiles. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, for he had nine hundred chariots of iron, and twenty years he mightily oppressed the children of Israel. And Deborah, a prophetess, ah, Deborah, a prophetess, you know, there was several uh, women prophets in the Bible, prophetess. And Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth. Guys, how would you like to be married to a prophetess? Um, a little note here. Was there not a man in all of Israel whose heart was as pure as Deborah's? Probably not. I mean, if you get a woman that's heart's uh, the most pure, uh, God will use them for sure. You know? And Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, she judged Israel at that time. So not only was she a 
a prophet, but she was the judge. She was the ruler. So, guys, take that and put it in your pipe and smoke it. And she dwelt under the palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in Mount Ephraim. And the children of Israel came up to her for judgment. And she sent and called Barak, the son of Ibn Noam, out of uh, Kadesh Naphtali. Oh, okay, Kadesh Naphtali. And said unto him, Hath not the Lord God of Israel commanded, saying, Go and draw toward Mount Tabor, and take with thee ten thousand men of the children of Naphtali and of the children of Zebulun? Now, if you don't know what Ze uh, Zebulun and Naphtali are, they were uh, two tribes of the children of Israel. There's twelve tribes. I'm sorry, but Jews don't, there's only one tribe. One tribe. Judah's only one tribe. There's eleven more. Verse 7. And I will draw unto thee to the river Kishon Sisera, the captain of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his multitude, and I will deliver him into thine hand. And Barak, I guess he's the, he's the general, and Barak, Barak said unto her, If you won't go with me and hold my hand, I'm not going to go, because I'm scared. Oh, wait, that's the Bob translation. And Barak said unto her, If thou wilt go with me, then I will go. But if thou wilt not go with me, then I will not go. I want you to hold my hand. I'm scared. I don't blame him. And she said, I will surely go with thee. Notwithstanding the journey that thou takest shall not be for thine honor. For the Lord shall sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. And Deborah arose and went with Barak to Kedesh. And Barak called Zebulun and Naphtali to Kedesh. And he went up with 10,000 men at his feet. And Deborah went up with him. Now Heber the Kenite, which was of the children of Hobab, the father-in-law of Moses, had severed himself from the Kenites and pitched his tent in unto the plain of Zanam, which is by Kadesh. And they showed Sisera that Barak, the son of Abinoam, was gone up to Mount Tabor. And Sisera gathered together all his chariots, even 900 chariots of iron, and all the people that were with him from Harothsheth of the Gentiles unto the river of Kishon. And Deborah said unto Barak, Up, for this is the day in which the Lord hath delivered Sisera into thine hand. Is not the Lord gone out before thee? So Barak went down from Mount Tabor and ten thousand men after him. And the Lord discomforted Sisera and all his chariots and all his host with the edge of the sword before Barak so that Sisera lighted down off his chariot and fled away on his feet. Uh, when it says the Lord discomforted Sisera and all his chariots, uh, you know, the Lord probably knocked the wheels out. Or, you know, that's what I'm thinking. And a chariot without wheels is of no use. So Sisera stepped down from his chariot and ran away on his foot, on feet. But Barak pursued after the chariots and after the host unto Harosheth of the Gentiles, and all the hosts of Sisera fell upon the edge of the sword, and there was not a man left. In other words, he killed them all. Howbeit Sisera fled away on his feet to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite. For there was peace between Jabin the king of Hazor and the house of Heber the Kenite. And Jael went out to meet Sisera and said unto him, Turn in, my lord, turn in to me, fear not. And when he had turned in unto her into the tent, she covered him with a mantle. And he said unto her, Give me, I pray thee, a little water to drink, for I am thirsty. And she opened a bottle of milk and gave him drink and covered him. Again he said unto her, Stand in the door of the tent, and it shall be when any man doth come and inquire of thee, and say, Is there any man here that thou shalt say, No? 
In other words, hide me. Verse 21. Then Jael, Heber's wife, took a nail of the tent and took an hammer in her hand and went softly unto him and smote the nail into his temples and fastened it to the ground, for he was fast asleep and weary, so he died. Remember Deborah said that this guy would be given into the hands of a woman? Ah, you thought it was Deborah. No. It was Jael, Heber's wife. I guess she took a, a tent peg, a nail, and uh <laughs> drove it through his skull into the ground. Wow. So he died. And behold, as Barak pursued Sisera, Jael came out to meet him and said unto him, Come, and I will show thee the man whom thou seekest. And when he came into her tent, behold, Sisera lay dead, and the nail was in his temples. So God subdued on that day Jabin the king of Canaan before the children of Israel, and the hand of the children of Israel proffered and prevailed, prospered, and the hand of the children of Israel prospered and prevailed against Jabin, the king of Canaan, until they had destroyed Jabin, king of Canaan. All right, people, we've gone an hour, and um, I guess this is going to be part one of falling away. Well, the great falling away, I guess you could say. Um, all blessings, praise, glory, and honor to God the Father and His only begotten Son of God, which is Jesus, who is the Christ, the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to Him and Him alone. In Jesus' precious name, amen. <laughs>